Let's Not Meet Stories, number two. Story one. Guy that started following me in the woods. Hey there, this isn't necessarily the worst thing that could ever happen, but it still shook me up a bit. As a bit of backstory, I'm from a really rural area, and I've recently moved to the city for university. I'd started to feel a bit homesick and missing the countryside, so I decided to go on a walk in the woods close to my accommodation. I live on the outskirts of my city. It was still light when I started my walk, about 2pm. With it being winter, it's been getting to be pitch black at about 4.30. After about an hour and a half of walking, I noticed that it was, it was starting to get pretty dark, so I turned back because I didn't want to be in a forest I'd never been in before in total darkness, mainly in case I got lost. On my way back, I saw a guy in maybe his early 20s, obviously drunk, with a plastic bag full of bottles of alcohol and muttering to himself. As I was on a path with steep slopes on either side, I was pretty much forced to walk past him, doing so with keeping as much distance as possible between myself and him and keeping my eyes focused straight ahead. As soon as I passed him, his muttering became much louder and I was sure he was trying to talk to me, but it was still unintelligible so I ignored him. Then I heard him yelling and turned around to see him walking towards me. There was about 10 meters between us. I still couldn't make out what he was saying, but he was walking quickly towards me and eyeing me up and down with a really creepy look on his face. Not wanting to have any trouble, especially considering I'd only seen one other person quite a while beforehand, I simply said, nah, leave me alone. He, cl he clearly heard as I saw him register my sentence through his drunken brain, yet he simply shook his head and carried on walking towards me. At this point, I panicked, pulled out my phone and shouted, I'll call the police! I knew this was an empty threat considering the fact that I didn't even know the name of the forest and knew that it'd be a long time before the police would get to me, not to mention my phone was at 10% before I'd even left and knew most of that had gone on taking photos. I guess in this case I was lucky he was drunk as he froze, put his hands up and mumbled, alright, before beginning to back away. I walked quickly away, looking several times over my shoulder to see, to check if he was following me. It's probably a good thing I did, seeing as each time I looked he was facing me, maybe to check to see if I would notice before he could get to me. Like I said, this could have been nothing and have simply been a harmless drunk guy that I blew out of proportion. Either way, next time I go for a walk, I'm fully charging my phone and taking a kitchen knife with me. Anyway, drunk creepy guy that may or may not have had bad intentions, let's not meet. Story 2 Followed us around, then sat on my car. Last weekend, me, female, and my boyfriend went to a museum in the city. We had parked the car down the street in a fence lot besides a park in a garage. The museum also had an ice rink nearby, so we planned to go skating afterwards. Our museum passes came with vouchers for the gift shop, so we weren't going to waste them and wanted to drop off our items in the car before going skating. We had to cross the street and walk a little bit up the street from the museum to get to the car. So we walked a little bit up the street, then once we're across from the lot, I noticed a man standing towards the edge of the fence. He's being kind of weird, pacing back and forth looking over at us, and looking around everywhere else and back and forth between the two. We were the only other people outside in this particular area at the time, and while my boyfriend and I are both pretty strong, and he could fight someone easily if it came down to it, neither of us are very big. So I was pretty freaked out and decided to put my phone away just in case. I didn't want to cross so close to him, but before I could say anything, the traffic cleared and my boyfriend had started crossing the street. As we're crossing, we walk diagonally so we don't walk right up to him, but he starts walking towards us. We reach the other side and I figure he's going to ask us for money or something because he looked like there was a chance he could be homeless, but he doesn't. He doesn't say anything. He just starts walking in front of us in the direction we're going and keeps looking back at us to make sure we're still going in the same direction. By this point, my boyfriend had realized something is off with him too. The guy walks through the gate of the lot as we do and then walks towards the ticket slash payment booth at the gate. So now I'm a little relieved and thinking I was worried for nothing and that he's just the guy who runs the booth. Wrong. As we passed the booth, I noticed he didn't go inside it. He just stopped and stood between the booth and a bush until we passed. Then once we were in front of him, he started following us kind of from behind and to the side like we wouldn't notice. My boyfriend had been trying not to look towards the guy this whole time. He had my keys in his hand which had my pepper spray on them, but I wanted to be able to warn him if this guy was going to try to pull something, so I fell behind him a little bit. The three of us were now walking in a triangle formation towards my car, which was parked on the far side of the lot. That's when I noticed he's got something in his hand. It looked like it could be a knife, but he takes a bite out. Okay cool, just a candy bar. 
At this point, we're about 15 feet from the car. The guy walks around the passenger side towards the front door, which is when I tell my boyfriend to unlock the door quickly. We both get into the backseat driver's side and immediately lock the doors before he gets near the front door. Car is a fairly large sedan, so he wasn't at it yet. When he realizes neither of us are outside anymore, he walks to the front of the car and leans against the hood towards the passenger side and just sits there for a little bit. I'm about to call the police when he decides to light a cigarette and starts walking away. Once he was a good distance from us, we climbed into the front seats and decided we were going to go park in a different lot before we went skating. As we left, we watched him cross the street and head into the lobby of another building, still looking back at us the whole time. We both expressed how weird and creepy he was and how relieved we were that he left without any really dangerous issues. We almost went home but decided to drive around and found parking closer to the skating rink. We stayed and skated but I was on edge for the rest of the day looking out for this guy. What really freaked me out was that he was only a few feet away from us the whole time and we had no idea why he was following us. Maybe the guy was mentally ill or he could have been trying to rob us, just mess with us or even worse. I can't help but think that when he walked to the passenger side he was waiting for me to be alone. This particular city is high in human trafficking rates. Story 3 A grown man thought me and my friend were prostitutes. We were 11. When I was a kid, I used to go up to the Smoky Mountains and stay with my friend and her family for a few days to a week. One time my friend's dad drove me and my friend down to Asheville and C, which was about an hour and a half away. My friend and I had put on a lot of makeup that day because we were preteen girls and we were having fun with makeup. Even with the makeup, it was still very obvious that we were children. We went into a mellow mushroom to sit down and eat when a man who was probably in his 30s or 40s started talking to my friend. The situation quickly turned sinister when it became apparent that the man thought my dad's friend was a pimp and he was interested in my friend. I'm pretty sure my friend's dad threatened to disembowel the guy and then we all promptly left and drove back to the mountain home. My friend's dad had to explain to us later what happened and why we went home so abruptly. Story 4 Classmate I hadn't talked to in 3 years threatened to kill me. So this starts out with an unfortunate incident that I don't really like to admit. When I was in 7th grade I had my first and only hookup. Nothing major happened but it was enough to make me realize that I didn't want to be involved in that kind of thing and was a pretty huge prude from that point on. The guy this involved, his friend, my friend and I had all grown up in the same neighborhood but I had moved to a different neighborhood a few years before and didn't know the guys as well as she did. I'm hanging out with my friend Kate at her house and she says, hey let's hang out with Caleb and Luke. I agree and we go to Luke's house where Caleb was also hanging out. We get there, nothing weird at first and Kate says, hey so Caleb thinks you're pretty cute. This is a point in my life where I was very desperate for the approval of others. I was not popular and not many guys had ever been interested in me so I was very excited about this. Caleb was on the varsity football team, which I was a cheerleader for, and he was also admittedly attractive. I couldn't believe he was interested in me, and it clouded my already 13 year old ju level judgment. We all go upstairs, and this is where things got weird. The guys literally started putting on porn and watching it in front of us, like literal DVDs. I was a little weirded out, but again, I had no experience with guys, and it didn't bother me as much as it should have. I was desperate to prove to this guy that I was cool, so I said nothing. A few minutes later, someone suggested that we play 7 Minutes in Heaven, and of course I got paired up with Caleb. Kate knew my bad luck with guys, and I think she had good intentions, but this was definitely not the right way to go about things. So we go into the bathroom and small things happen, by normal people's standards I guess. Then we come out. I was very naive and knew next to nothing about anything sexual. It was a rude awakening and I wanted no part of it again. We didn't stay long after that. Nothing ever developed further between Caleb and I, and I was glad. Fast forward to sophomore year of high school, I had completely forgotten about him. I was a totally different person at this point. Super goth, career oriented as a budding opera singer and very anti-relationship because I saw it as distracting from my goals. That day with Caleb had some very negative lasting effects on me where sex was concerned and I had become very afraid of it and ultra protective of my virginity and innocence. I was not prepared for what I encountered that day and it messed me up to a point where I couldn't even say the word sex out loud until I was married and pregnant with my first child. Anyway, I'm 16 at this point in time and just chilling in my room. I suddenly get this mysterious text from an unknown number, hey sexy. I asked who it was and he says, I'll give you a hint we had sex. 
I informed him that was impossible because I was a virgin, so he must have the wrong number. He says, well, we almost did. I again said that I'd never even almost had sex with anyone. As naive as I was at 13, I would have never let it go that far. So he finally says, it's Caleb. Don't you remember me? We hooked up. The memories came flooding back. I started to freak out. He said something along the lines of wanting to hook up again and started saying really gross things that were really triggering. Now I admit I was on a bit of a high horse about my modesty because I would not be taken advantage of again and was proud to have my priorities straight. I lost my temper. I told him, how dare you think I'd do that shit with you? Leave me alone you asshole. And a few other things I kind of regret. That didn't go well. He lost it and started screaming over text about what a stuck up bitch I was. Then he says the kicker. Whatever, I know where you live. I could come kill you if I want. I freaked out and immediately called my dad crying. He came home from work and we called the police. They went and talked to him but ultimately did nothing. I got lucky in the fact that it scared him off and I haven't heard from him since. Our school was enormous so we never saw each other either. But it could have just angered him more and something truly terrible could have happened. But yeah, to the slimy kid who thought it was okay to ask for a hookup after three years of total silence, then threaten my life, let's never meet again. Story 5 Chased by three trucks on the Mexico border. I was on a cross-country road trip with my best friend to San Antonio, Texas. She was being stationed there, army nurse. We drove down from our home state of Connecticut. We stopped in Waco, Texas for the night and ended up at some small shitty dive bar that we truly had no business being at. I know how dumb it sounds, but we had previously been at some bar that was just kind of boring and very guppy college kid style. We were on an adventure, why should we be at a bar in Texas that felt like we were still in Connecticut? So we were a bit drunk and feeling reckless and decided to call a cab, telling him to take us to, and I quote, the seediest bar in town. The cab driver says, well, I know a good place, but you girls really shouldn't be going there. Of course we convince him, no we want to go, we're fine, we can hold our own, we love a good bar, blah blah blah. So he drops us to the other side of town and parks in front of this shithole and says, I'm going to wait here for 10 minutes for you to change your mind and I'll take you back home. So we get out of the car all confident and walk into the bar. When I say the music stopped the moment we walked in, I mean the music actually stopped. Like in a scene from a movie where the DJ stops the track and everyone looks up and stares. LOL, we realized the moment we walked in, we shouldn't have come, but, but we're both proud and say fuck it, we're here, let's have a drink. We, we were the youngest in the room in our early 20s, I'm in this short jean dress with cowboy boots, everyone is 50 plus, Mexican rap music blasting. There's a man sleeping on the bar next to us, head on the bar snoring. There's a couple of 50 year old women who I'm assuming must have been hookers doing actual lines on the pool table in the corner. Some men around them all with huge chains counting money on the table. We stood out as we're the only not Mexicans in the room. Before I get hate online, I'm only saying this for context. There's another guy at the bar so wasted who starts talking to us, but he's so drunk he's not making any sense. We kind of just small chat agreeably feeling uncomfortable. We have one beer and are just feeling really out of place, so we say, okay, we can go now, bucket list check, let's get out of here. So we step out of the bar and realize that the cab driver has left us. There's a couple of guys standing out by the car who start yelling to us, catcalling. We're ready to just get back to the hotel. This is right before Uber has become popular. It was a few years ago, maybe 2013, 2014? Here's where we go really wrong. We look up on GPS and realize that the hotel is about a half a mile away. Walkable distance, right? Caution to the wind, we start walking home. Now looking back, I realize how dumb that was because there were no street lights, we were in a shitty part of town, and it was pretty deserted. As we're walking down the street, this pickup truck drives by, no big deal. I only noticed because there were really no other cars on the street that had passed us in the past five minutes or so of walking. We keep going and notice that same pickup truck had turned around at the light and was coming back towards us again. I thought that was kind of odd because they literally just passed us and I made mention of it to my friend. The truck slowly passes us and two men are staring at us with honestly the most disturbing look in their eyes. We're freaked out now. The truck then turns around again and starts coming back towards us. At this point our senses finally kicked in and we screamed and ran 
and we just started sprinting down the street. The truck is now fully chasing us. We run down some side street. They follow. Another truck joins them with a few more men in it. We run through a car lot with them circling the perimeter. We were luckily so close to our hotel at this point. We cut through another business with a fence around it. The whole time these trucks following us. We sprint to the hotel and run through the front doors. The trucks pull up to our hotel and stop in the front and just sit there staring in. We make it up to our room and make sure not to, not to turn on the lights. We lock and barricade the doors, keep the curtains pulled, and shit our pants for the rest of the night. By far the scariest moment in my life. I still get chills thinking about it years later. We could have absolutely been sold into the Mexican sex trafficking trade, all because we were two dumb girls. Story 6 Never Trust Pretty Neighborhoods if the story gets too confusing, I'm sorry, I may have problems to explain since English isn't my first language. Okay, this happened when I was 12 years old, so my parents were apart since they had problems in their relationship for reasons that do not matter in this story. I was staying with my mom in this house with two floors, though we only rented the second floor so we were only allowed to be there. To be honest, I loved that place. It wasn't super big, but after living in a house with only one room where our kitchen was in the same place as our living room and the bathroom was luckily, luckily just as big enough as to extend your arms and touch each wall, I loved it. I wanted to be there. I didn't want to keep moving house to house as my family did every year. Sadly, I stopped loving it so quickly when the person who rented us the house told us that, that there was only one key. To give context, there was the door where we entered, the first and principal door, and there was another door on the balcony which was really big and that door was always open since, again, we didn't have the keys for it. My mom saw it fine but that creeped me out. That door headed just really close to my room. My mom said she was going to change the locks but I know my parents, they say they're going to do one thing soon and they do it for next year. So I tried to ignore it and think that maybe I was too paranoid. Of course the inevitable happened. One day in the morning after I went to school and my mom was in her job, someone entered our house and took everything of value. TV, laptop, a camera, some PS3 games, not the PS3 because I took it to my grandma's house to play with some cousins, even the money for rent that we had hidden in one of the jackets of our closet. When we finally got to our house, I felt really scared. I cried because I was afraid that if someone entered our house like that, when they knew we were gone, then what would stop them to do it again when me and my mom were in? After all, I'm a kid. They could easily do whatever they want. My dad stayed with us that night and made sure to stay as much time as my mom allowed him to, to make sure we were okay. But this doesn't end here. One day I was with a friend, her mom, and obviously my mom too, when we started to hear footsteps on the balcony and the roof. We quickly called the police. They came an hour later and we got the worst news from them. They said that the police from our area wasn't going to investigate nor getting close to our neighborhood. It seems that just as pretty as it looks, the neighbors had paid the police to don't come close. Is that legal? No, I don't think so. I know you won't believe me, but I'm from Argentina in a part of Buenos Aires that isn't known for being the safest place to be, and we have lots of reasons to hate the police. That's one of them. Heck, I'm sure that most Argentinians don't trust policemen. Either way, after changing the locks, we moved from there and my parents got together again. Police from that area, you suck, and whoever that was walking on my balcony at 10pm, please, let's not meet. Story 7 I had a lovely time with the two ladies at the front desk. I've been debating whether to post this here or on our tales from the front desk, but this story honestly seems more appropriate for Let's Not Meet. I'm 20 years old and a front desk agent at a mid-range hotel in a small east coast city. I'm a full-time student at the university and live alone in a one-bedroom apartment in a neighborhood made up of mostly college students. At the hotel, I've had to deal with a fair amount of unpleasant or creepy people since a young woman in a customer service job seems like an easy target. I was used to old ladies yelling at me or inappropriately aged men making remarks on my appearance like, you have just the most adorable smile, I'm sure you're a heartbreaker, and I've usually been able to deflect. When I work on weekdays, I'm always on the 3pm to 11pm shift where we handle check-ins. It was a slow night where we only had 28 check-ins to deal with. By 8 p.m., my coworker Mindy and I had done all our tasks and were leaning over the front desk chatting and watching the news, which blared perpetually from the TVs in the lobby's breakfast area. We only had a handful of check-ins left, so we had kicked back with our deck of cards and Chinese takeout all over the desk. 
A younger man checked in and I remember thinking he was cutish, but definitely looked Republican. He had neat blonde hair, a boyish smile, and a weak chin and was wearing khakis and a quarter zip fleece. We had a pretty regular interaction save for him making a lot of eye contact and smiling, and he went to his room. About half an hour later, he came back down and asked us where he could get alcohol. We told him the convenience stores across the street had beer and wine, and he and I joked a little about how it was closing soon so we had better run there. When he came back, he slid a 40 ounce across the desk toward me. With my customer service smile of vague cluelessness, I said, What's this? It's for you, he leaned against the desk. Front desk agents have to stand up so the top tier of the desk was about chest height, and when he leaned over, he was right in my face. Oh, I can't drink right now, but thank you. I think you should be the one to enjoy that. He was insistent, and I agreed I would take it to drink after work, and I went into the office and put it with Mindy's stuff. She'd appreciate the free alcohol, but I didn't feel good about drinking a 40 from some too friendly guy. He hung around the desk for a while. Mindy is the type of person who can keep someone talking for hours even if they don't want to because her brain never runs out of content and she treats everyone like she's known them for years. This meant that this guy who I'll call Mr. Hansen wasn't leaving anytime soon. They were talking about politics and I heard him throw around some vaguely conservative rhetoric, but I pretended to be engrossed in my homework. He kept glancing over at me and trying to smile, but it was getting late, my feet hurt, and all I wanted was to be at home in my underwear, rolling a spliff with my cats all around me, instead of allowing some 35-year-old to think he could flirt. At one point, Mindy had to make a phone call, so he slid down the desk toward me. I looked up with my customer service smile back on. So, go to a small liberal arts college, do you? My uniform shirt was short sleeved so you could see a couple of tattoos on my arm and I have a nose piercing so I assumed that and the music theory homework I was working on informed his guess. No, haha, <laughs> I go to the university of the state we're in. The city's main attraction besides its hippies and breweries was my college, a pretty good state school so it was somewhat surprising he didn't assume I went there instead. He was sizing me up and I prayed that Mindy would be done with her phone call soon but it was her long distance boyfriend and she had wandered into the back office to talk to him. He started talking about his experiences at his southern university and how he was a veteran but got injured so he lived off pension or something and didn't work and was just touring New England right now. The conversation somehow turned to his love life, but I'm pretty sure I was so spaced out by that point thinking about how I was going to eat at least an entire frozen pizza when I got home that I didn't pay attention to what he was saying until it was clear he had asked me a question. Would you do that? He asked. Would I do what? Get freaked out because I don't work? A lot of the chicks I date think that's weird. I remember exactly what he said because I thought it was weird he calls girls chicks and how he spat it out. I laughed nervously and said, I don't know, I don't think so. The hotel was on the smaller side and I was very aware of the fact that Mindy and I were the only employees in the building right then. He began to ask me probing questions about my love life along the lines of, Are you single? No? Well, why do you like him? Would you like him if he moved away? Do you think you'll be with him a long time? The last question freaked me out, and I wish I had asked him to stop asking me personal questions like that, but I'm polite to a fault even when I'm not working, so I kept smiling and laughing and giving friendly but impersonal answers. You're very warm, he told me. Have you ever worked with kids? He talked about how a lot of the girls he dates, back wherever he was from, Ohio maybe, are shallow and materialistic, and how I seemed like such a down-to-earth girl, and I was such a cutie, and did I know about the girl next door trope. I'm like the girl next door but cool, he told me. I imagine he was referring to my tattoos again. At this point, I was physically queasy and uncomfortable but couldn't disengage. Guest reviews are hugely important in the hospitality business, so at this hotel we're strictly trying to let guests treat you however they want, you, can't, you just can't upset them. It would probably have been reasonable at this point to ask him to leave the front desk, but I felt so helpless and being assertive with people at work is so against my instinct that it didn't even cross my mind to say anything. Because of this, I had to stay there listening to this guy and politely accepting compliments. I assume he typically got away with it since he was attractive and clean cut with a slight baby face. I kept praying for the phone to ring and for someone to ask me to perform some sort of complicated and long task so I could get away, but the only time it did was when a neighboring hotel called to ask me if we had printer ink. Mindy was on the phone in the back until eventually Sam, our night auditor, arrived and I realized that this guy had monopolized the entire last two hours of my shift trying to get me to sleep with him and or admit I secretly supported Trump. No. 
Hoping Mr. Hansen would take this as his cue to leave, I went into the office and got my coat and backpack. When I came back out to witness Sam count the drawer, Mr. Hansen was still standing there. Well, I hope you have a good night, I said to him. Are you walking out this way? He gestured down the hallway, which led to all of the rooms as well as the door to the back parking lot. I told him I had parked out front, which thankfully was true, and was able to get to my car successfully. I sat there for a while responding to the text that had piled up on my phone while Mr. Hansen was diverting my attention. It was about a 10 minute drive from the hotel to my apartment downtown, and I noticed that a car was pulling out of the parking lot at the same time I was. It wasn't Mindy's car, she always stayed an extra half hour after her shift technically ended. But there was another hotel next door so I assume it was an employee or guest there. I wasn't too concerned when the Nissan was right behind me, but I noticed it had Florida plates, which a lot of rental cars around here do. I take a weird way to get across town after work, which involves cutting through the university hospital's enormous, needlessly complex parking lot, which spans about three blocks. It wasn't necessarily a quicker route, but I liked how there were never any cars there at this time of night and I could go as fast as I wanted to in a Subaru Outback, so not in a cool way. The parking lot, as I said, is needlessly complex, which means stoplights, which all turn into blinking yellows after 9pm, medians and grassy areas placed seemingly at random, and a lot of twists and turns which all go to very specific buildings and exits. I'm explaining this parking lot in so much detail to express how strange it was that this rental car was following me this pretty nonsensical route. It's not a way that any kind of maps app would take you since there are more straightforward streets surrounding the parking lot. I initially assumed it was someone going to the hospital since it was the only major medical facility in about a 100 mile radius and the only well funded one in an even larger area. A lot of people and their family stayed at the hotel who were there for the hospital so the momentary explanation I gave myself seemed feasible. It was maintaining a polite distance but it was one of those cars with the ultra bright LED headlights which were blinding in my mirror so the car was impossible to ignore. It followed me around each turn and at one point just to see I went in a big circle around the south half of the lot. Surely enough the other car made the same circle. My explanation, which was already crumbling, dissolved completely when I drove past the entrances to both the main hospital and the emergency room. Steady consumption of crime shows, scary movies, and true crime reddit pages slash podcasts have made me a very paranoid person. Serial killers really seem to love college-aged women. So at that point, I picked up that something was probably wrong. I figured I should avoid going back to my real apartment, especially since it's just begging to be broken into with a lot of windows and a very old front door that opens directly to the outside. Obviously at this point I was relatively certain it was Mr. Hansen. Like I said, I'd had guests cross the line before, making me come out from behind the desk to hug them, touching me when I'm straightening up the lobby, asking the front desk to bring up a towel and answering the door in various states of undress, etc. But I had never been followed or particularly fixated on. A hotel receptionist, even if they're good looking, is someone you have a couple brief and pleasant interactions with, but you don't really think about them when they're not there. I decided my best bet would be to get back to the hotel. I looped back through town, the Nissan following at a polite distance. I'll reiterate, he was trying to be as discreet as he could, keeping as far behind as he could while, st while still keeping me in sight. He wasn't trying to intimidate me so much as, I'm not sure, monitor me? Whatever his reasons, I was still afraid. I abandoned the use of turn signals and sped back to the hotel, calling the hotel along the way and asking Sam if he and possibly the security guard we contracted to patrol the property after 11pm could meet me at the front door. When I arrived back at the hotel, I pulled around to the front where Sam and the security guard were standing under the awning while the Nissan hit the gas to the back lot. I explained the situation and the security guard went out the back door to look for the car and his driver. When he came back, he said that he spoke to a preppy blonde guy outside who was coming inside. He had said he had just been out to smoke a cigarette and was now returning to his room. Security asked him if he'd seen a Nissan with Florida plates and he said that he hadn't. There wasn't much more we could do at that point. Luckily, I wouldn't be working for a couple days after Mr. Hansen was set to check out and we were fully sold that weekend so we couldn't extend his stay if, we, if he wanted to. All guests are asked upon check-in to write down make, model, color, and plate of their vehicle on the registration card. So just to confirm, I pulled his reg registration card. Sure enough, silver Nissan Altima with Florida plates. Here's what he wrote on his TripAdvisor review, edited for privacy. Great stay, room was clean, breakfast was hot, and that's all I can ask for lol. The best thing about this, name of the hotel brand, was the staff though. I had a lovely time with the two ladies at the front desk my name, especially, a very sweet girl. 
hoping to be seeing you sooner rather than later. Mr. Hansen, we won't meet because my manager put you on the banned list. 